John Evans, author, actor, uh, film director, philanthropist, <laughs> music, musician. The list goes on and on, sir. John Evans, thank you so much for coming on the Uniweb interview show. I'm your host, Matthew Whiteside. As always, I appreciate your time. How are you today, John? I'm doing okay. Doing okay. <laughs> yeah. It's a pleasure to be here. You are you are located in the UK. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Several cross, hours cross the pond. <laughs> or behind. I'm not sure. <laughs> Several hours different. <laughs> yeah, we found that out the fun way. Yeah. Um, <laughs> one of us still is re is re trying to wake up. The other one wants to go to bed. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I'm glad we I'm glad we were able to connect though. Um yeah, and thank you for taking the time out of your day to join me. So you you've got a lot of stuff going on. Um, looking at your website, you've got uh, one published book, and you have another book coming out May first. Um, not entirely correct. I have okay. five published books. Five published books. Six okay, out May the first. Oh, I was <laughs> I looked under the wrong tab. I saw one tab, one book under one tab on your website. Uh, you have five published books. Yeah. So. Let's talk about those, shall we? <laughs> That's what we're here for, isn't it? <laughs> I think so. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes I have no clue why I'm here. <laughs> I live with that every day. <laughs> That's right. It's such an existential question. What am I doing? <laughs> so, with that, your books. What uh, what's the, what's your latest book that you've that you've published? The latest one that I published, which actually came out. Uh, about three weeks ago, oh, wow. um, is called Fool in the Ring. It's a supernatural thriller, and it is the sequel to the one you've probably seen, The Unwilling Recruit. Yeah. And so, yeah, I see Fool in the Ring, and that came out three weeks ago. About that, yeah. About Beginning. three weeks ago. Yeah. So what's what are these books about? This is book two in a series. That's right, yeah. Uh, they're supernatural thrillers, modern day setting, um, focus on a key character by the name of John Hunt, um, who starts off as a war correspondent in the Middle East mm -hmm. uh, and ends up through various means um, in an explosion that uh, leaves him six months in hospital, horribly disfigured, um, uh, kills his cameraman, um, and once he's uh, recovered from that, mm. um, he finds that his world has changed. Mm. Exactly how and why, he's not entirely sure. But the first big change is his cameraman paying him a call, his dead cameraman paying him a call. Like a ghost of Christmas past. Uh, something like that, yeah. Yeah. Uh, a bit more gruesome, but... <laughs> <laughs> more like a zombie-style uh, approach? Or like well, a... he, 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 basically, the cameraman looks how he does uh, at the last point where he was alive, which was uh, partially dismembered limbs and... Uh, <laughs> having been in an explosion, he's not going to look particularly pretty. Yeah, that's right. So that turns. <laughs> so he he goes. You're. It's called the unwilling recruit, and he goes through this. Um, he goes through this horrible explosion, mm -hmm. and now he's on a mission to figure out his world all over uh, again. I w at this stage, I wouldn't say he's on a mission. He's kind of being led by the nose. The nodes, as in, he does all he wants to do is just get his world back in order. Okay, because uh, the the knock on effects of this explosion, the reasons behind it, and everything have had a devastating effect on his life in mm. all aspects. Uh, but then, adding to that, this sudden apparition um, of his cameraman that throws his whole world that completely out of kilter yeah um and not, not used to talking guess, to the dead 
Uh, yeah, I, I guess book one is uh, about him trying to understand what just exactly what has gone on, what has happened and why. Right. Um, and in and around that, um, there's various other events and various other people that play their part. Um, and I describe it as a supernatural thriller rather than a horror. Although right. there are horror aspects of it. I've been mm -hmm. described as um, akin to sort of Stephen King or um, um, is it Robert McCarman um, in terms of story content and writing style. Okay. Um, so I guess, I, I guess it, it sort of, it's a weird bridging of that supernatural thriller and horror genre. Okay. Is, does the character, uh, does he possess any supernatural powers or is it more just the realm that he's playing in is uh, more of a supernatural I, realm? Because I don't want to give too much away. Okay. I got you. Uh, um, I'm not going to go down that route. <laughs> <laughs> that line of conversation will kind of stall there, I'm afraid, Matt. <laughs> That's okay. I understand. So what was the what was the inspiration for Unwilling Recruit and uh, Fool in the Ring? What, what uh, kind of questions did you ask yourself or what was the the thing that brought you to want to write this kind of novel? Um, now there's a story behind that. <laughs> there always uh, is. Yeah. Um, as you said in the introduction, uh, I've been a filmmaker, actor, and producer, director, and all of that sort of stuff in the past. Uh, and obviously yeah. one of the elements of that was script writing as well, because I used to write and produce my own feature films. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the unwilling recruit actually began as a script for a feature film okay. uh, and the inspiration behind the script was an author i used to read uh called michael moorcock i don't know if you've heard of him over there i haven't mm. uh, it's very big author in the, especially in the 60s 70s he's still writing now uh, but he came up with uh, a fantasy series uh, that, that became really, really popular. Um, uh, Stormbringer, Elric of Mel Number Day. Um, all sword and sorcery stuff. Okay. And I loved it. I loved the whole series. But he did a standalone book that was kind of set apart from everything uh, called The Warhound and the World's Pain, which okay. was set in the sort of, uh, I think it's 14th, 15th century Europe. Mm -hmm. um, and it was a fascinating book, all very religious uh, in, to, in some of its own, uh, overtones, very supernatural, uh, and obviously with the medieval twist. It was a very fascinating read. Right. And I wanted to see if I could, take the concept behind that story and adapt it into a film script mm. and that began the process of the unwilling recruit originally i was adapting the idea of the warhound into a film script then that all stalled about 10 years ago i was halfway through writing the script uh and uh my life completely changed overnight um okay. i um Ended up, my, um, my mother had a massive stroke, ended up completely disabled. That was like, literally like, you know, overnight. Wow. Um, and I gave up my film production company, gave up my business, my work, so that I could become my mother's full-time carer. Wow. Um, and so all of that side of my life just stopped at that point. Yeah. Um, and I've been looking after mum ever since, still am. Um, now, we move forward about five years mm -hmm. and start writing because I need to do something creatively. Yeah. Um, and I started writing various other bits and pieces that were focused on my role as a carer. Um, right. I'm more like therapy, if you like. Sure. Um, I love therapy. <laughs> yeah, uh, it, it is. It, there, there was a very cathartic. It was a very cathartic Absolutely. exercise. Absolutely. Um, and uh, it's turned out to be a very useful exercise in the long run as well. It went in directions I didn't expect. 
Yeah. But after writing a couple of books about caring and throwing a book of poetry out onto the market as well, um, I came across just randomly um, an old Word document on my system, which was the original film script that I was working on when mum had a stroke. Uh, and yeah. I looked at it again. And I went, actually, this story is too good just, just to sit on a Word document on a computer. I need to do something with it. Yeah. Oh, so I thought, well, I can't make a film. Why don't I write a book? And that's what began The Unwilling Recruit. And as I started tr converting the script into a novel, it changed radically in my head. The whole story concept changed. The whole mm -hmm. essence changed. And I suddenly had this kind of light bulb moment about two chapters in where I went, actually, this isn't a novel. This is a series, and it's a big series. Oh, and I wow. could see the end of the series at that point already. I could see the final scene of the story play out in my head as I was wow. writing the second chapter. And we're talking, this is probably going to go 12, maybe 20 books. Holy crap. <laughs> this, this is a big story. Wow. Uh, and it's going to go a long way. Um, but I could see the entire story play out. Yeah. Uh, I could see the potential of it. Um, and it's taken twists and turns and directions I never envisioned. It's, it's, it bears little resemblance to the original script that I picked up. Wow. Um, that's, it, it, that's incredible to, to think about being able to see a, a, something that you had created 10 years ago then in, in five years completely change and have an idea that went from being this one uh, standalone movie to possibly a novel and then it turns into possibly 20 books but being able to see that far in the future like filling in all the gaps in between how do you even go about doing something like that i mean is it like akin to like uh, doing episodes in a, in a television show or uh that's a really good analogy okay. uh thanks <laughs> because that is exactly how these books play out. Um, I look at each novel as another episode. And at some point, when I've got the energy to do it, I'm going to sit down and re-script them as TV episode scripts. Wow. And see if I can approach someone about maybe having it done as, uh, as a TV series. Wow. Because I'd really like that. That would be cool. <laughs> that is the premise that each book works on. There's, there's the underlying um, theme through the entire series, mm -hmm. the underlying plot. But each book in and of itself has its own solo story as well. Sure. So it works very much like a TV series in that context. Very cool. Each episode connects, but each episode also kind of to a point stands alone as a story in its own right mm. yeah that really it, it always blows my mind to be able to see people um write these incredibly long series like i look at the jack reacher series and stuff like that and it just blows my mind to see a book tra like traverse that period of time like from the 90s to or i guess late 90s to 2000s yeah um, and just continue to go on and go on with these amazing stories um, how long have, has it taken you to work on these books? Like, what was the, the flesh out time for each, for each novel so far? Uh, the first two novels, first drafts of each were written in a month. Okay. So you um, hammer it out pretty, you just get after it when you start. When I sit down and write, I write. Yeah. I, I <laughs> easily pump out five to 10,000 words in a day. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Are yeah. you like, you're, you're like Kermit on a typewriter. Just kind of um, <laughs> getting after it. it. It's one of the, you see, um, I go through, I, I'm, I'm very much of a, uh, a roller coaster kind of person because I'm, uh, I'm bipolar. Okay. So I go through these very, very uh, extreme mood swings. Yeah. yeah. Um, when I'm on a low, I'm completely non functional. Yeah. Um, and to give you an idea of how long that can last for, I have actually not put pen to paper 
in the past, uh, up until uh, February this year, I had not put pen to paper for nearly eight months. Wow. Because I just... You were just in a low. Then, yeah. February, I hit a high. And February, I released a novel. March, I released a novel. <laughs> April, I've just finished off the third one to be released 1st of May. And I'm already now uh, eight chapters. That's 100 pages into book three of the series. And wow. on book two of the children's book. <laughs> that's amazing yeah yeah absolutely and that's what i've kind of learned with the bipolar is that uh i always used to beat myself up when i was uh on a low because i wasn't i wasn't productive mm -hmm. but then i realized when i'm on a high i'm so super productive that it balances out yeah because i, so I i'm very much an insomniac as well so i don't i i very rarely get to bed before three or four in the morning wow because of my care commitments, I'm up at 6.30 every morning regardless. Mm -hmm. So I get between two to four hours sleep a day. Wow. And so I've got to fill that time and make it productive. <laughs> that sounds exhausting, man. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It'll work. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Uh, those days, I am absolutely battered. But... Yeah. Uh, I've got three people with disabilities I look after. I've got myself with bipolar, and somewhere along the way, I've got to try and do something that I feel is worthwhile, and that's where the writing and the music comes in. Absolutely, uh, and it's it's awesome that you you have that outlook on it because a lot of us we can beat ourselves up for being down and and feeling unproductive and low, um, but there is a balance to it, right? And mm. Yeah, there has yeah. to be a balance. There's, yeah, there's a balance in everything, whether we want to see it or not. Yeah. It's there. That, that's, that's the trick, uh, uh, I think, is taking the time to, uh, uh, and having the ability to step outside of yourself and look objectively yep. at who you are, what you are, and what you're doing. Absolutely. That's something that we, as a species, actually really struggle with. Yeah. Uh, and I think part of it is that we're not encouraged to take that time an awful lot. No, it's we we're told to keep moving no matter what. And oh, uh, it's too fast. We don't yeah. have time to stop and and analyze what's going on. Yeah. yeah. Because the moment we stop, life just rolls past us or rolls over us, or at least right. that's what we're taught. Right. It's not true. It's not. <laughs> it's not, not true. Yeah. It's a complete fallacy. I yeah, because it's like this idea that we're we're in a, a race with somebody, like we're racing against somebody or something. When in reality, we're all going to the same place. Um, you know, might as well take some time and look around for a bit, and then and try it your best to enjoy enjoy the journey. The only and race you're ever in, and the only person you're ever competing with, is yourself. Yeah, absolutely, and. That's the bit that people don't get. If you're competing with yourself, there's always going to be one winner, and that's going to be you. What you yeah. have to define is what you want to win. Yeah. It's pretty profound stuff, man. It's very true. I've and spent I, 40 years thinking about this. <laughs> it's, no, yeah, absolutely, man. And it's one of the things I think as creative individuals, um, we all kind of we all kind of struggle with because we're always looking for some other perspective. Oh, I don't have to look for other perspectives. They find me. They show up. It's my they, just... they beat down my door. That's right. <laughs> they kick in your door. I'm here, man. Pay yeah. attention to. Me. So, so how has the uh, how has the music translated for you? How how often do you do you uh, do you play? You're in a band, right? Yes, I am. Um, <clears throat> that's another weird story. Because um, nice. um, one of the Music's always been a part of my life. Um, I was a singer as a teenager. I actually sang with a band um, uh, as a teenager. And uh, I've done lots of stuff since then. Singing was what got me into acting. Okay. Uh, because I, I started off by doing stage musicals. Oh, wow. Very cool. Uh, that's how I got into acting. Yeah. Uh, and then went from that to film and 
so on and so forth. But uh, then, of course, when all of this happened with the family and the care concerns and everything, I ended up becoming very isolated for a lot of years. Uh, so much so that about two years ago now, I'd reached the point where I'd actually not been out of the house for three years. Wow. At all. And like you're a complete shut in. Yeah, because my care con duties and, uh, and yeah. the, what was involved with them, I just didn't feel I could leave the environment sure. outside, out of my control. Yeah. Uh, but I reached a point that I'd become so isolated that if a friend sent me a text about, oh, we're going out to see a band on this uh, such and such a night, come on out and join us. As much as I would want to, the instant I get the text, I'd start to get a panic attack about the idea of going out and meeting people. Yeah. Because I hadn't done it for so long. Yeah. Um, so I was really starting to get to a very dark place about two years ago with this. Um, and a very good friend of mine, who I'm very grateful for, um, popped up around this time and he's been a musician for 30 odd years uh and he runs uh open mics in the city uh and he was actually holding one about three streets over from where i lived and he he, he, he literally just turned up at my door and said you have no excuse it's so close i'm taking you there oh my god <laughs> that, must have been, that must have been absolutely terrifying um, you would think so. I would. <laughs> uh, you see, it, it's one of the weird things with the way I control bipolar. I don't feel emotions the same way other people do. Mm -hmm. Um, so everyone says, you know, getting on stage, don't you get nervous? Uh, well, no, I don't feel nervous. Hmm. Never have. Wow. Uh, um, I don't get that adrenaline rush from being on stage. None of that. It's it's very it's a very surreal experience for me. Uh, yeah. the, or flat. Huh. Like like is just is it like almost like an out of body kind of feeling? Like you're uh, almost watching yourself do something. Weirdly, the only way I can feel something when I'm performing is by creating a character to perform with. Yeah. So you and can I'm, be in the moment with that character. The character feels. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, it's it's very weird. It, it, it's why I enjoyed stage acting so much because I yeah. would be the person I was supposed to be on stage. Yeah, and me, John Evans, would cease to exist. Sure. Um, I've it got makes a weird sense. It's like you're protecting I, yourself almost. Uh, perhaps there may be an element of that to it. Um, no, I'm, yeah, I'm no psycho now. I don't know. I'm just. <laughs> I, I, I actually am. Uh, I've studied psycho psychology, so yeah. Um, but even even I stumble at looking at my own psyche. <laughs> I think we all do. <laughs> it's like, what the hell's going took on? Me out to this open mic. Yeah. Uh, uh, and we ended up jamming a couple of songs together. Mm. Um, and no one threw anything at us, which I took as a plus. So success. Uh, yeah, <laughs> you know. I survived. That's right. Um, and we've been doing open mics together now since then. We uh, do regular sets. I mean, I'm usually out at an open mic at least once a week. But then off the back of that, I decided I wanted to learn an instrument so that I could do stuff off my own bat rather than rely on another musician being there. Mm -hmm. So about... Uh, year and a half ago 18 months i started uh, he started teaching me the guitar and a couple of months later i decided no nah, guitar doesn't work for me but he had this semi-acoustic bass line around yeah so i picked that up and literally four days after i picked that up i went up and did an open mic with him and played live six songs on bass you picked it up that fast first song i played was under pressure by queen that's four days after picking up the bass. Holy crap, man. And like then, a savant. Weeks later, I joined a band. <laughs> I guess not. That was <laughs> January last year. 
and we put out our first EP a um, couple of months ago. Congratulations. Uh, and we're gigging all over the place. I'm, I'm off to Blackpool, which is like four hour drive away uh, for a gig at the weekend. Wow. Uh, How we're do you... on our second single now. Well, let me ask you this. How do you deal with uh, leaving the home now? I mean, obviously you're doing it all the time. You're going on uh, road trips to play gigs and that kind of thing. How does that, how does that process work for you mentally? Are you, um, do you have, do you have help now? Or are you reaching out to other people for help? Uh, are you doing things for your, for your mental health to be able to take care of that? Uh, the biggest challenge is getting uh, qualified people into the house to cover the period that I'm not there. Sure. Um, to make sure that the three people who, that are here are safe and cared for uh, mm -hmm. in absence. That's been a, a fight to get the funding and to actually find the individuals that can do that. Yeah. Um, and it's still, it's, it's a constant fight, that is. Um, logistically, anytime I leave the house, uh, I, I can't do a spontaneous oh, I'm going to go out uh, to a gig uh, tomorrow night. Right. Um, unless it's a local gig. Uh, anything that's got any distance involved, I need, I, it takes me about a month to plan. Wow. The logistics for it are huge. <clears throat> yeah. Um, so, and like I say, it's, ta it's taken me eight years to put stuff in place that even allows me to do that. Right. Um. So, but without it, uh, I mean, there's been a massive change in my um, mental state this past two years since I've been back doing the music uh, and getting out and uh, meeting people again. That's had a real positive impact uh, on uh, the on the bipolar, especially. Yeah, because uh, bipolar is very very heavily affected by stress. Sure. Pressure. So the more stress and pressure and fatigue I'm under, the worse the bipolar gets and the harder it is for me to control it. Sure. Um, so everything's kind of had a positive uplift for the past two years. That's not to say it's easy in any stretch of the imagination, but it's it's manageable. And that's and that's something that you know we can all hope for, right? Because I mean life I don't think for anybody life is easy. <laughs> I think life is is got all of its all kinds of curveballs in it, but finding joy in certain things like being able to go do music and write and find things that you're passionate about and get to really enjoy, I think is important for everybody to hear that. Even even if they're not struggling with any kind of mental illness or because I've been diagnosed with bipolar as well, and um, it was it was something that I, I kind of struggled with for a while, but like putting a name to it, putting uh, ideas of who I was and who I am and all that kind of stuff behind me and just looking for joy in certain moments and things and doing, doing them regardless and not having this idea that I have to feel joyful to be able to do something. I have to feel uh, great. I have to be like this perfect manic person <laughs> all the time, you know, because we all want to be manic all the time, but like, even oh, when I'm not that way, even when I'm not that way, I can still have a good life. Yeah even through those those down times that's the thing isn't it? It, it it's how we measure our own level of success yeah in our life right um and i think society pushes us to measure ourselves according to certain yardsticks that they provide right uh and i think a lot of us struggle with that yep um me personally, I just went, society, go away. <laughs> That's right. By yardsticks I devise. Yeah. If they work with yours, fine. If not, do I care? Right. And that's made my life a lot easier. Yeah. Um, and ultimately... I go through life now. I, I, I don't class myself as a good person or a bad person or anything like that. I, I just try and do the best I can with what I've got. Yep. Um, I know the first half of my life, I was a complete nightmare. 
<laughs> same oh, same here. In a very <laughs> funny way. I had no control of my bipolar. I was self-destructive. Um, I did lots of bad. Yeah. Um, I don't try and excuse any of it with the bipolar. I made lots of very poor choices. Um, I recognize what I did then. I can't change what I did then. What I can do is try and be better now. Right. And that's all I can do. Yep. Um, I will never sit and measure my degree of success in that regard. Right. I will just continue trying to do the best I can. Uh, other people can decide whether or not I've been successful. That's up to them. Um, that's not for me to say, and it never will be. Yeah. Um, but I think by taking those kind of attitudes on board, I'm taking a lot of the pressure off myself. Mm -hmm. Because the only pressure I've got is the pressure to be as good as I can be. Yeah. By my standards. Right. Not anyone else's, not society's, not the world's, but mine. Right. Um, now, as daft as it sounds, I'm never going to succeed on that particular yardstick. <laughs> I know. But it's the only one that matters to me. Yeah. Well, it's the progress, right? As long as we're making progress yeah. towards something. And each day holds a whole new cup of of, of challenges and, and gifts and blessings. And we just have to be willing to do whatever we can with them in that, that day. That's it. That's all you can do. That's all any of us can do. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think that this whole thing with mental health, especially men's mental health, not, not to detract from... Uh, difficulties that women have but weirdly society does not encourage men to speak out about mental health issues yeah we're supposed to be the rocks that everyone clings to i know yeah okay yeah yeah enough limpets cling to me i will sink okay <laughs> <That's right. laughs> it's that right. simple people yeah. so uh, i'll be a rock for as long as you want me to be but unless you allow me to actually vent occasionally yeah. we're going to be in a world of hurt very quickly yeah you know well, I think the only way we've been taught to express anything is through anger or just not at all. Um, and I, drinking and drinking and drugs has been an acceptable way for it. men. That, that's know. caused more of our problems than, than anything else. And it's yeah. society that causes that problem, which is bizarre. Society is supposed to be community. It's supposed to help. We're supposed to help each other. In actual fact, what society ends up doing is pushing us further apart from each other, hitting mm -hmm. us, and making our lives more difficult. Yeah. And that strikes me as totally counterproductive. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah we, we created society to improve our lives, not to take our lives. Exactly. It's, it's kind yeah. of, and, it, and it's kind of, it, it's up to us to wake up to that fact because no one else is going to do it for us. No. Um, it's unfortunate that we have to get to a point where it gets so painful and miserable that we finally are like, wait a second, there's something off here. Yeah. And like, I, I, that is what happens. Uh, and unfortunately, I mean, I, I was an alcoholic for over 30 years. Uh, what I didn't know at the time was that was my way of self-medicating the bipolar. Yeah. Creating a world for myself that I could exist in, if you like. Yeah. Um, but that got so bad that I did reach a certain point where it was make or break. Yeah. Um, and I was one of the lucky ones. I was able to turn it around. Yeah. Um, there's so many people that reach that point without anyone ever realizing they're heading there. And they, they don't manage to turn it around. They don't. It's great. Yeah. It's, it's um, interesting you bring up uh, alcoholic. I don't know if you've seen any of this stuff, the other stuff I do, but I talk about my alcoholism a lot. Um, I'm nine months sober right now, and it's the best best life I've ever I've ever lived. And it's not because of anything outside of me necessarily has changed, but because of all the stuff inside of me internally has changed. And I've started doing these creative outlets, learning how to process my emotions and my feelings and work through things as opposed to just drown things, look for oblivion. I'm looking for light now, <laughs> which is something that we have to, I had to learn 
like in this room I talk about in this room this is like I was on my deathbed honestly mm-hmm. and it is sad to say that there are a lot of people who don't get the opportunity to ever see the other side of uh, addiction alcoholism depression bipolar they only see the death like that's their only way out unfortunately and for the the numbers of suicide rates among men but you know uh below the age of 30 have risen in to insane amounts because this idea of who we're supposed to be what we're supposed to be like just pour alcohol on it pour drugs on it just yeah. get through it get the house get the money get the credit score get the cars whatever get the, get all the stuff you'll be happy you'll be but you'll be seen as a success in reality there's this whole issue where we're dying spiritually we're dying mentally and we don't know what to do about it Mm -hmm. that's exactly exactly what's going on yeah um and i i mean you'll you'll know this i i i I will never call myself uh, i will always call myself an alcoholic yeah i've not drunk in nearly 10 years Wow. I still call myself an alcoholic. Right. Because I know um, how seductive that stuff is. <laughs> I walk into a pub now to do an open mic. Mm-hmm. My eye still automatically goes to the top shelf of the bar. Yeah, absolutely. Straight away to the spirit section. Yep. And <laughs> I still have... 10 years on yeah. to taste in my mouth. I can taste the spirits. Yeah. You know, um, that's never going to leave me. Right. So the fight against the alcohol is going to be with me till the day I die. Yeah. Um, the same with gambling. I, I, I used to be stuck on that. Yeah. I, I still fight against that every day. And I will always fight these distractions. Yeah. Um, so, but that you can fight them. That's the point. Right. You know, uh, it, it, it's a battle worth fighting, as you know yourself, because absolutely you, on the other side, yeah, is so much better. So much better. Uh, <laughs> there's a lot of pain through to get there. Yep. I mean, but it's it, not always easy every day either. No, it's not. I mean, God, there's days when I really could kill for a drink. Yeah. But it's never going to be one drink. Right. No. <laughs> I know that. I open yeah. a bottle of spirits. I know it's never going to be one drink. It will be the bottle. Yep. Absolutely. And then a drunken drive to get more. Surety is what helps me not open the bottle. Yeah absolutely you know yeah but i but we we both know because if if we were in a really desperate situation it could so easily push us back sure it has for me a, a lot of times mm. i it's it's not like i i've been perfect in it and i think that's the thing like learning how to process those very difficult rough times it's like where are we building our foundation on yeah. you know and uh for me it, it has been in a program uh, of recovery and th- thank god i have it because if i didn't there have been like i even i even wrote this morning a, a article called i am depressed because god man the past two weeks i've been like seriously just miserable and i can't you know i'm doing all the same things mm-hmm. and it's just a downturn it's like life yeah. happens but i'm not i'm not gonna fall apart because of it now because i have a oh, simple uh, simple steps to work through the process of life and it's just I, I related it to breathing like i can breathe i have to breathe every day i have to breathe all day yeah. and when i breathe in it feels good but if i hold that breath in for too long it can kill me so i have to let it out but if I don't breathe in again, it'll kill me again. So I have to continually breathe in and out. And that's what life is. It's just a continual process of changing, of breathing in and out so we don't die. But it's like having that, I have to just let things go. 
receive whatever gift is coming, let it back out. It's just moving constantly yep. and being okay with that. It's like being okay with being fluid with life and not getting so caught up in, I'm going to feel this way forever. Life is never going to get better. I'm a miserable person. That's why I feel this way. And I'll never be not a miserable person. Like that has to be shattered. And it's, thank God it has been because life is even in the, even in the bad times, like the past couple of weeks when it's just been down, it's still so much better than my life, how it was. Yeah. You know, and you can attest to that, I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> and not just me. I mean, the people around me can attest to the difference as well. Yeah. <laughs> right. Well, it's, it's a fact. I would not be able to do the things I do for my family. Sure. Had I still been at the bottom of the bottle. Yeah. Right. You know? The past 10 years would not have been possible. Yeah. That's as simple as it gets, which means, uh, you know, looking after my partner, my son, my mum, all three of which are disabled, wouldn't, I, I wouldn't have coped with that. Right. The writing would never have happened. The music would never have happened. We'd never be sitting here having this conversation. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, and that's the miracle of it all, too, uh, in feeling like this. And how I felt in getting a chance to talk to you and realize that I'm not alone in this during a time when I feel like, ugh, you know, yeah. what a crazy, like, you can call it coincidence if you want, but I don't believe in that. I, I believe that things are all happening around me for a reason. And it, it's amazing to see it and just be aware of it and be like, holy crap, yeah. <laughs> you know, and it's because I've, I've had goosebumps during this conversation waking up to the idea that other people are dealing with it and they're getting through it and they're making things happen in their life, even though they're going through the same things I'm going through. Yeah. And I think that, that for me, that's part of what the whole writing and the music is about for me. Uh, I mean, the writing originally started, the, care, the books about caring started as a way of connecting with other people that were in the same position that might be feeling as isolated as alone, as depressed, and just saying to them through the medium of the books, you are not alone. Yeah. You know, um, it's progressed now into something more with, with all the rest of the writing and the music into saying, not only are you not alone, but if you keep working at it, there's a way through and there's something the other side that you can gain for yourself. Absolutely. Um, and I think, and that's what, that's what it is for me. The books, the music, they're my way, if you like, of scorekeeping my success. Yeah. If that makes sense. Because it's a very Absolutely. physical, real thing to turn around and pick up a book and go, I've done that. Despite everything else I've been through, and all, all the messes I've made in my life up to this point, mm -hmm. this is one good thing. Yeah. And it's there. It's solid. Absolutely. Don't take it away from me. Mm -hmm. you know? um, and that's as much a part of my ongoing uh, therapy, recovery, whatever you want to call it, as anything else is. Absolutely. Yeah. But you also do charity work. Well, I use both the writing and the music to support uh, local charities. Um, the writing is very specific on the charities I support because there's uh, <clears throat> obviously my, my, with my son and his disabilities, uh, I've been connected to, to, to a local charity that supports parents uh, of children with uh, special needs. Okay. Uh, and with them being a local charity, they don't get a lot of funding. In fact, they get no funding. Uh, they get uh, their they don't get a lot of awareness raised. So I thought um, I'd try and use my writing to help them out as a way of saying thank you for helping me. Yeah. You know? um, so what I do there is 50% of all of the profits from the John Hunt novels goes straight to them. Um, mm -hmm. And then with the children's book series that comes out next month, uh, I'll be doing the same, 50% of all the children's book profits will go to uh, 
a charity which is a uh, a center for uh, dis- disabled children. Mm. Um, it's uh, completely charitably funded uh, and it supports children with special needs uh, early years, so up to a sort of five, six year old preschool. Um, and it's it's such a worthwhile organization. Uh, it's called the Peter Pan Center. Um, Peter Pan Center, okay. Yeah. Um, but if anyone wants to know anything about it, obviously uh, um, there's uh, on my website, there's uh, uh, I've written a couple of pieces on my blog and there's a couple of solid links on the front page of the website to both of the charities that I support. Okay. Oops. And I'll put I'll make sure to put links in the the video description so people can check that out too. Yeah, yeah. Um, but that's just my way of of kind of giving back to people that I either know are doing such excellent work or have directly uh, <laughs> supported me over over the years. Yeah. Um, and then with the music, um, I, do, I as a band we do. About half of our gigs are charity gigs mm. um, for different charities around the city. Um, and we, 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 we just donate our time to try and help other people. It's as simple as that. You sure. know, um, yeah. it, it, it's, it, it's something you find uh, in the music uh, at our level in the music industry is a sense of community is yeah. really, really strong. Uh, so when a call goes out by, by one band, oh, we want to do a charity gig for this, that, and the other, you know, within a day, 20, 30 bands in the local area all, all jumped up and said, oh, we'll join you on that. Put us, sign us up, you know. Wow. Uh, and it's a really nice yeah. community response that you get. Um, I mean, we had uh, a, a few weeks ago, uh, a local musician was doing a, uh, setting up a charity gig for uh, in aid of homeless people in the city. Mm-hmm. Um, and literally within the first 24 hours of posting it on Facebook, he'd had so many responses that the gig was filled and he decided to extend it and he's actually put out an album featuring tracks of bands that weren't able to actually appear on the uh, on the gig. Wow. You know, uh, and it's just awesome when that kind of thing happens. Yeah. You know? Uh, and obviously everything that's raised for that's uh, gigs for digs. Everything that's raised for that goes goes to help the homeless people, you know? Wow. Yeah. Uh, um, and again, that's something that I, I identify with because I've been homeless before. Yeah. You know? Uh, so I know what it feels like. Uh, and I, the thing that always frustrates me um uh, when you hear people talking about the homeless is the misconceptions about homeless people. Um, And the lack of realization that all of us are so close to potentially being homeless. Yeah. All it takes is one significant negative event. And like that, you can find yourself on the streets. Yeah. It doesn't matter what your intellect level, what your previous income level, none of that matters. That's how fast your life can change and you can find yourself on the streets. Yeah. Um, so I don't like judging people that I see on the streets because you don't know what's going on. I've, I've always had a very uh, strong interest in homeless people as well. And I've actually spent some time trying to be homeless during drinking days because I knew, and I always thought there was, uh, because there's, there's obviously something there. It's not like somebody just wakes up and they're homeless, you know, things happen. And, but, but there's, there's always, there's always something that happens and it's, and that's what what I'm saying is like, instead of just judging like, Oh, this person is just lazy. They can't get their act together, whatever it is. It's like, Mm. what, what's the what 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 happened you know and what's continuing to happen Mm -hmm. and that that, that's the big thing it's you've got their initial instigator event that actually puts them on the streets 
which yeah. is significant enough in its own right. But then that gets compounded. Uh, and I'm pretty sure it's probably the same in your country as it is in mine by the state response to them once they're on the streets, mm. which is at you become best, roaches, but, you become vermin. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you're like a rat needing to so be the possibility that they can recover then from that significant response, the event rather, is so remote because the support just isn't there. Yeah. That within a very short space of time, they just spiral down mentally because yeah. they, they don't have anywhere else to go. Right. Um, and that's, that's one of the things that constantly runs around, around my head. I, 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 do th I, I think about all kinds of weird and wonderful stuff. You get used to <laughs> Uh, I'm a writer, for Christ's That's sake. right. That's right. Uh, <laughs> but one of the things that constantly bemuses me, as a species, we use up resources like they're going out of fashion. Yeah. Yet the one resource that we have in abundance, we never want to make proper use of ourselves. We're quite happy to discard that resource without a second thought. Kick it to the curb and forget about it. Yeah. Yet that is possibly, almost certainly, the most valuable resource that we have to ensure our survival and our evolution. Yeah. And yet we do not use it. We, we do, do not... It. It. We do not grow it. Yeah, we devalue it. Yeah, and I don't get that. I right. just do not get that. <laughs> it's so contradictory. Yeah. Well, it's uh, it's like realizing that um, you know, if we if we if we allowed everyone to believe, or if, if we started working on people, gave them the tools to believe that they had everything they needed and were fulfilled and could be successful with what they had, then it would shut down the whole system, man. <laughs> it would it would absolutely uproot everything, you know? And that's scary to a lot of people. It's scary to the people that have the control. Correct. Yeah. That's what it comes down to, is control. Yeah, absolutely. It's like... Uh, they don't want to give anybody the key when it's when in reality the key is available to all of us it's just in a series of like um programming and illusions we're made to believe that they hold the key when it's like it's it's and that's why i think uh for people like us who have been had to go down the darkest path we realize their key is already available to us we just have to be willing to pick it up yeah. and do something with it you know see, back in um back in uh sort of middle ages times dark ages times when religion was just uh coming to the fore uh mm -hmm. christian religion that is mm -hmm. uh, uh one of the things i found fascinating about the whole uh rise of christianity was uh the bible itself okay Reading was not taught to the common people. Right. Okay. So mm -hmm. their knowledge of the Bible was only what the priests told them. Yep. Their interpretation of the Bible was only what the priests gave them. Right. Yeah. That's control. Yeah. Simple. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, in our way, that's exactly what society does to the populace now. Right. The legal system is couched in such ridiculously complex and convoluted <laughs> language yeah. that unless you've sat and studied it for 20 years, you've got no hope of navigating it solo. Yep. That's straight away an element of control removed from your life and put into someone else's hands. And a right. big element. Medical profession is the same. Government is the same. <laughs> it's all control. Yeah. Um, and 
And the people it's, in those fields don't even still are like struggling to figure it out themselves. They're just learning how to play the game that that yeah. was set in front of them. It's like it's 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 more like learning the rules to a game, not even understanding the law, so to speak, but learning the rules to a game and then manipulating it to your will. Or I mean, this is the thing: you don't even know anymore what game is being played and by who. <laughs> I know. <laughs> it's so ridiculously complex now yeah. that it's just nuts. Yeah. Totally nuts. And you are not, you can never present. If a person stood up and said, I understand how this world works, I would laugh in his face. I'd yeah. say, right, okay, so you are God. Yeah. Because that's the only person I'm going to believe that message from. Right. Trust me, if God stood up in front of me and said, I'm God and I understand the world, then it'd be like, right, you've got some accountability coming to you, lad. Yeah. You know, because if you if you understand it and you've been sitting here watching it go around this little circus for the past 2,000 years, mate, then, sorry, speaking as someone who has been very mentally challenged over the past 50 years, you can edit this out if you want to. No. You are so mentally screwed <laughs> it doesn't even bear thinking about it's interesting though right it is because and i, and I talk about this a lot the the kind of the, the stuff that we're going through it's we've gone through it through all of human history there's lulls and there's mm -hmm. upticks there's madness there's insanity somehow we're still here somehow we're here in a bigger number than we've ever been and i think honestly we're evolving mentally, spiritually now. I think that it's it. we're all getting pushed to a bottleneck where it's starting, people's eyes are starting to open up because it's so uncomfortable. Uh, everything is so magnified. We're all looked at through cameras. Um, we're all on social media. Everything that happens to us is so magnified that something like, you know, 20 years ago, if I did something stupid, it wasn't on camera on social media. Now, if I do something stupid, it's a media on social media. There's got to be apologies. There's got to be all kinds of stuff going on. So it's the awareness has increased so much to everything in life that we have to we have to start looking deeper within ourselves. And I think it's happening. I know it's happened for me. I see it. I go to meetings all the time. I see it and all these other people. Um, of course it's not happening at the speed I'd like, right? But when is everything, when has anything happened when I like it to happen? Uh, but I do see it changing and it, it's just like being okay with, this is where I am. This is my experience. This is just me experiencing this, this physical place right now, you know? Yeah. So. Uh, I agree. It's, uh, things are changing. Um, but they're only changing, they're changing from the ground up rather than the top down. Yeah. And that's a slower, more difficult battle. Yeah. Um, but, yes, things are changing. They are. Uh, the only thing that I get tired of is all of this political correctness. <laughs> I know. I can't do that, I'm afraid. I can't do it. I understand it. It's it's like we've become so politically correct that you know what microtransgressions are. Where they where they talk about microtransgressions, like you can't say anything without offending somebody. Yeah. And even saying you're offended is offending somebody, and it's just like, man. But I think that's I th I think that that is part of it. It's it's all a growth process. People have got to, we have to learn to accept one another. We have to learn to be uncomfortable with things. Um, but we have to learn to see also from a new perspective, too. Yeah. I, I think the perspective that we see from has been smaller, smaller minded, and it's growing. It's growing very strangely. And I don't know how the <laughs> hell. <it's happened. laughs> like, I do agree that the PC, the PC stuff People can't take jokes anymore. And they can't take honesty either. 
Honesty. Oh, and that's the, something about honesty. It's honesty. like when we hear honesty, everyone's like either like, oh, my God, that's amazing. Or like, how dare you? Yeah. But it's, we're so conditioned to hear bullshit all the time. Exactly. And <laughs> and when I, we hear I, honesty, it blows our minds. I can't be doing with that. Uh, again, it, part of being bipolar, I'm, uh, I'm as blunt as they come. I will call a spade a spade and I will have no problem beating someone over the head with it if that's what it takes to get a message across. Yeah. Um, that doesn't mean I use offensive language. Right. But I'm extremely direct. If someone is being an idiot, I will tell them they are being an idiot. Right. And I will qualify that with an example of why. <laughs> and then they will take offense because sure. I've called them an idiot. It's like, well, sorry, if you don't want me to call you an idiot, then don't be an idiot. <laughs> it's not rocket science, is it? It's not. You know? Yeah. And I get so wound up with that. It's like, come on, guys. But I think I think with that too, it's like we have to um I think that's part of like judging other people too, right? And w where's my place in that? Trying to figure out like well, have I been an idiot before? Yes. Is this affecting me negatively? Yes or no? Like having to ask myself those questions. And I find that like I've, I do a lot of meditation. I find that I don't get as irritated anymore uh, by those certain things because there's like a buffer between my reaction to idiotic things or because I'm now like I pull myself back because you I'm like, OK, what's this going to do to me? Yeah, because, like, what's it going to do to me if I do get in an argument with this person about the way I think they're being? Is it going to help me or hurt me? And a lot of times it's just not worth, it. like, picking picking my battles, you know what I mean? Yeah, I know exactly what you mean. And, and in principle, I agree with you completely. <laughs> um. <laughs> That's right. Um, it's hard in practice, man. It's so yeah, hard. it is. Sometimes, sometimes the mouth just goes long before the brain's engaged, you sure. know. Uh, yeah. And the knee-jerk response and my quick, um, my quick wit, shall we say, if we're going to be polite about it, kicks sure. in. Uh, <laughs> and 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 they've got offended before I've even finished the first sentence. So, right. at which point I'm royally screwed. <laughs> but I think we're all learning to to have some form of grace for one another because we're I think more than anything else what we're realizing is that not a single one of us on this planet is perfect uh, because of it and we're giving we're we're now given the chance to give grace as opposed to judgment and hate. Yeah, and, the thing you is, know, see, I will always if people make mistakes, it's like okay, we're human, we make mistakes. Fine, I'll point the mistake out. I'll say why it was a mistake. If they then come back 10 minutes later and make exactly the same mistake, yeah, I might start having an issue. Right. Yeah? Yeah. Uh, I take the view for myself. I've got zero problem. If, if I screw up, and I do on a regular basis, I will hold my hands up to it. Right. I will apologize. I, I won't try and make excuses for it because there's no point. If I've screwed up, I've screwed up. Hello. Yeah. Uh, I'll hold my hand up to it, I'll apologize for it, and it will not happen again. Right. Yeah. It's that's what making amends to it is, right? It's like just trying to be different. Yeah. I can't take away the screw up, but I can make sure I don't do it twice. Absolutely. You know? Uh, and I can take ownership of the fact that it was my screw up. Yeah. You know? <laughs> but unfortunately, that's not an attitude that I see too often around me. No, that well, we we all we all kind of have the idea that failing is a death sentence. Um, that if I screw up, then it's over for me. And so, if anybody else in my life screws up, I better make sure that I let them know, and I'll never talk to them again. <laughs> like it's just, well, it's it's a fear. I know it's a fear. And see, this is what I told you. I, we get off. We get way. Um, we get going. Mm. <laughs> so. Uh, 
I do want to say thank you so much for for coming on the show. I really, I really have enjoyed talking with you, John. That was right. I know I told you thirty minutes. This is what happens though. Like I try to stay, but it, it's all good stuff, and I love talking about it. Um, thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, John Evans Author dot com is your website where we can find everything. I'll have descriptions or I'll have links in the description for that. Uh, your book is a children's book coming out May 1st. May 1st. Yes. Okay. So when this comes out, it'll already be out. <laughs> Thankfully. <Yeah. laughs> so make sure everyone, you guys go and support John Evans, his work and uh, the charities he's doing. Check out his books. Um, is there a place we can find your music as well? Is that on your website? Um, it's not on my website, uh, but they'll find information about it on my Twitter page. And there's a link to my Twitter off the website. So if awesome. you don't hook up to me on Twitter, uh, I'm posting regular stuff about music on Twitter. Awesome. Awesome. And also on my Facebook pages. The, the, I've got a Facebook page for my music as well as a separate one for my writing. So they can go find out all of that stuff. So everyone can go and harass John Evans on Twitter yes, and Facebook. By all means. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Better harassment never hurt. <laughs> That's right. No, absolutely not. It's called fandom. Um, as long as they go and buy the books as well. That's they right. Yeah, if they don't buy the books, then get the hell out of the way. <laughs> you have to pay to harass. Yeah. Um, <laughs> John, I'll give you the last word here, man. What's the what's the last thing you want to say to everybody? Um, thanks for listening. If you've got this far, we've not bored you to tears. <laughs> they made it. Uh, Really appreciate uh, you getting me on the show. I uh, had a great time. Uh, and good luck with your continuing recovery. Thank you. Um, we'll, we'll both keep touching base on that over time, I think. Yeah, man, definitely. <laughs> yeah, I hope, we, I hope we do, for sure. I'd look forward to it. All right, John. Have a great one, man. And you, Matt. Take care, mate. Thanks, sir.